be uh, completing some of captions for us. We might get underway. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge um, country, and acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and country and community. Um, I'd like to pay respects to elders past, present and future and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. And we acknowledge that sovereignty, or sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, for me, the traditional owners uh, were the Camaragal people of the uh, Darug Nation. Uh, so I'm down in Roseville, the southern end of the Bradfield electorate. Um, but across the electorate, there are different traditional owners. And in fact, we have people joining us from outside the electorate today as well. So we do meet on, on multiple uh, lands today. Um, tonight's session is a really exciting one. Um, uh, we've assembled a, a, a wonderful panel to talk through uh, such a critical um, issue. And really what we want to do tonight is explore the important issues relating to disability rights and inclusion, um, and really give um, you, the people on the call, the opportunity to share your experience um, with disability and uh, the NDIS, is, I guess the key sort of service provision uh, or political, uh, federal political policy mechanism. Um, and also give you the opportunity to ask um, Nicolette questions about her um, uh, policies in this area. Uh, and also um, if Heike and Jonathan say things that you would like to uh, hear more about, um, please feel free to ask questions of them um, as well. So I guess there's two ways you'll be sharing tonight. Um, one, via sharing your stories. And secondly, um, via asking questions. In both instances, um, we'll start by using uh, the Zoom chat function for you to share. Um, so if you would like to share at any um, point, please just open the chat function and, and share there. Uh, for those of you less familiar with Zoom, uh, if you hover over your Zoom panel, either at the top or the bottom, it depends on your settings, um, you'll see a little uh, group of icons pop up when you hover your mouse over them. Um, and the little speech bubble is the chat function. So click on that and uh, enter your uh, questions or comments uh, in there and we'll, we'll come to you as needed. Um, so tonight, um, we'll start with Nick providing an overview of um, the disability support system and some of the challenges that we, um, we face. Uh, and then uh, we'll spend a good chunk of the, the session, about half an hour, half of the session, um, sharing experiences. And so that's when we'll, we'll call on both Heike and Jonathan, but then also uh, give you the opportunity to share um, your stories as well. Um, and then we'll spend the last 15 minutes or so uh, with uh, a close on Nicolette's positions uh, in this space. So without further ado, um, I've foreshadowed who do, who's on the panel tonight, but let me introduce them. Um, so uh, Nicolette probably doesn't require any further introduction. Uh, Heike has recently been appointed as the CEO of Tech for Justice, um, which is a national justice project lab uh, building chatbots uh, that guide people who face disability discrimination through the process of um, raising an effective complaint uh, to the AHRC. Uh, she's a disability rights activist, a botcher mum and referee. Uh, and she was also previously uh, the president of the Association for Children with Disability in New South Wales. Um, she's also Nicolette's uh, sister-in-law, so full disclosure there, uh, married to Nick's uh, brother Richard. And Heike and her uh, family have recently moved away from Bradfield to Vincentia on the lovely South Coast. Um, appalling timing removing the opportunity to vote for Nicolette, but we'll forgive her for that anyway. Yeah. Uh, and Jonathan is the CEO and founder of uh, Australian Disability Limited, uh, which exists to create a more equitable and uh, equitable Australian society for people with disabilities through the production of online media and platforms to increase the visibility of issues facing the community. Um, he also served on the board of Physical Disability Australia for six years, um, ending just late last year. Uh, and Jonathan is a Bradfield um, local and he's here sharing his experience of um, living with a disability. His, president, his presence today is nonpartisan and shouldn't be taken to support uh, a specific candidate or party. So without further ado, um, I might hand over to, not I might, I will hand over to Nicolette uh, to take us through uh, some of the background on disability in Australia uh, and the current state of the system. Over to you, Nicolette. Thank you very much. And I just had a little e email from someone trying to join. So could you please check them in the waiting room? That's Wendy uh, Demerick. Thanks, guys. Okay, so by way of background, um, 
excuse the diagram, but according to the ABS, there's like one in six, like 18% or 4.4 million people in Australia uh, have a disability. And of those, 32%, a full 1.4 million have a severe or profound disability. In context, um, that's my little people on the bottom, that's 5.7% of the entire Australian population um, having a severe or profound disability. And that means that either they sometimes or they always need help with daily self-care, uh, mobility issues um, and help or communications activities. There's much, much more, of course, to living with a disability than the um, National Disability Insurance Scheme. And we'll probably hear about more of that from people um, more qualified to speak about that tonight. Um, but I, I am uh, really focusing in later on about the NDIS because I think it's something that uh, as a potential future politician, I need to be across. I need to understand what these issues are um, to people and our electorate about that. Um, so a little bit more about the NDIS. In, in 2010, the Australian government asked the Productivity Commission to carry out a public inquiry into uh, a long-term disability care support scheme. The Productivity Commission received over a thousand submissions from people with disability and from the disability sector. Uh, and pretty much the messages were clear, and that is that the system didn't work. The Prime Minister released the Productivity Commission's report a full year later in August of 2011, and, um, and then it was sort of picked up by the now defunct co um, COAG, uh, Coalition of Australian Governments. Um, Commonwealth of Australia, Co what is it, COAG, Commonwealth? No, Coalition of Australia. Uh, coalition, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Heike. Um, so in March 2013, the NDIS legislation was passed um, and established uh, the National Disability Insurance Agency. And then it was, the scheme was progressively rolled out over the Australian states and territories. So by 2015, it was up and going in, in most areas. And it was funded then for a five year period um, to the tune of $22 billion. The, NDIS more broadly looking into the objects of it. Um, and I've done this research purely on what one might find if one was an able-bodied seeing person on the internet, um, provide support for um, eligible people with um, intellectual, physical, sensory, cognitive, or um, psychosocial disability. And it provides what's called reasonable and necessary support for people living with disability. I was managed to find that there were three different stakeholders, principally um, at the center of this. The system comprises partners in the community. They're like those local area ones and early childhood coordinators. And they're like the allegedly the glue or the beacons, the sentinels that help find and connect users of the NDIS with the service providers in the local area. There's the NDIS participant themselves. Um, the one who's receiving funding from the NDIS towards achieving their own goals and their own NDIS plans. And then there is um, a third group. This is the service providers themselves. It could be anything from uh, physios and occupational therapists to people doing home modifications or even um, cleaners and caterers. Um, the main part of this, of course, is that those three elements together within a system are about helping people with disability achieve their goals. And those goals, as I mentioned, could be a range of things from um, with respect to speech and communication, um, living at home, keeping a job, uh, making friends. There's a whole range of different objectives that people might put in their plan. And so then where are we up to? The current reality is that um, according to, again, what's been disclosed um, on the agency's website, there have been about 500 participants that have been reached since it was established in 2015. But what I've it openly admits and what I'm hearing time and time again on the hustings and the stump, if you like, in Bradfield is that there's a truckload of red tape and wastage. Um, and it's really difficult even for people to find out how to start the process, let alone navigate the process when they're inside it. So I'm also hearing there's a lot around leakage in the process, particularly to things, for example, like high paid professionals in tier one legal firms that doesn't seem very fit for purpose. 
and that people with um, congenital disability are required year after year to medically reaffirm that they're still disabled um, in order to maintain or, or to roll their plans over in the future years, which seems somewhat ridiculous, wasteful, and frankly, I find medically and socially inappropriate. Um, so there's a looming blowout, and that's little wonder um, that there's been reported cost, um, if you like, clawbacks or um, people being withdrawn or having their programs um, cut. And um, of course, with those cost blowouts, very few politicians are talking about that sort of net benefit of the NDIS to the economy as well in terms of employment. Um, it's, a, it's a large employer of people, um, particularly certain types of people. It has obviously tax raising opportunities through GST and, and so forth. And it has on ongoing positive impacts overall to the burden more broadly financially on the broader healthcare system. More about that later. So what I've also heard that there are many opportunities to improve the NDIS. Um, and I, it seems unfortunately that the criticism seem to be more the rule than the exception. Um, I haven't actually heard from somebody yet on the street that have found the NDIS system a very pleasant and easy thing to navigate. In fact, there is a lot of trauma that goes on with being inside and part of that process. And that's from people who are extremely eloquent, able-bodied carers and advocates, and they are themselves are finding it absolutely heartless and stressful. Um, so there's a, a lot of improvement that needs to happen. So what to the future of um, the NDIS? Um, the big question I have really, which I think uh, is, do we care enough as a nation to maintain what was originally a relatively bipartisan view that the community at large should assist both people living with a disability and their carers? And in my view, this is a fundamental question of fairness and equity and these two principles are consistent with my own values and platform that I wish to take once I'm elected to the 47th Parliament. Um, of course, though, um, I am no expert uh, and that's why I'm, I'm thrilled that we can call on our panelists to share some of their experiences with us today. And so Ed, I'm gonna hand back to you, please, so that you can bring in our, um, to Jonathan and Heike to the conversation about their experience with um, the NDIS so far. Still on mute. Um, there we go. Thank <laughs> you. There's always one. Um, I've only been using Zoom for about three years now. So anyway. Um, uh, thank you, Nick. A wonderful introduction. Uh, now I have uh, introduced Hiker already, but I might I might turn to you um, first, Hiker. Um, but before I, I do, for those of you that are on the line that are interested in um, sharing some of your own experience, um, whilst Heike and Jonathan um, are sharing over the next sort of 10 minutes or 10 minutes or so, please jump into the chat and just um, enter some uh, information there. Um, or if you um, don't want to chat, you can also just stick up your hand and we will come to you. Um, directly uh, and the, the stick up your hand function again is in that similar um, part in Zoom. So hover your mouse down near the bottom or up near the top and, and you'll be able to, um, to do it there. Um, so Heike, really interested in hearing from you about some of the system uh, systemic barriers that exist um, and also really clearly what do you believe uh, needs to be done um, and, and why? Why do you think that some of the changes you think need to happen uh, will improve things? So over to you. Right, thank you, Ed, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm zooming in today from Jeringia country, um, which is often placed within the UN nation on the beautiful south coast. And um, I would like to pay my respect to elders past, present and future of this beautiful part of our country um, that have kept it so beautiful. Uh, and they have always known how to not care for just care for country but care for all members of their community including those with disability and we have I believe a lot to learn from our First Nations people in this regard. So I am here um, I have to acknowledge uh, a personal connection with Nicolette she's my amazing sister-in-law 
Um, this also makes her the auntie to our wonderful um, son, Bodhi, who's also on this Zoom today, listening in and learning all about politics. Bodhi has a disability, um, quite a severe physical disability, so he drives with an electric wheelchair. And let's just say that life is not always easy for him. Which brings me very neatly to the first question, what is our experience with disability? Um, in a nutshell, discrimination. Uh, I think disability is the one big area of human and or civil rights, if you prefer, that no one has ever even heard of and hasn't even acknowledged. We all know about misogyny, we all know about sexism and racism, but ableism does not get a mention much and people think it's quite okay to make disparaging comments about those with disability and people think it's quite okay to ignore people with disability. Um, if you don't believe me just think about the recent COVID mentality around COVID. Oh well, you know, um, they're people with underlying medical conditions i.e. disability. And it doesn't matter if they get COVID as long as we don't get it. It's all fine. So there's this whole sort of underlying attitude. And I find that for my child, it permeates everything into their daily life, which is why I um, specialize in disability discrimination uh, work as an advocate. Um, I'll try and keep it equally short. NDIS, my experience has not been very great. So um, our family was involved, uh, sat around the table uh, in the early 2000s when the NDIS was a pipe dream um, and we helped to get it started. Um, in fact, Bodhi was one of the poster children on the very, very first NDIS campaign poster. And it was a beautiful scheme. And if it had been implemented and kept the way it was supposed to work, it would have been fantastic. But it has been underfunded, it has been understaffed, and it's been bureaucratized, and it is an absolute nightmare. And I think mostly because there is that ableism and discrimination, and fundamentally society doesn't seem to care. And secondly, the big mistake that the NDIA has made is there's an old saying in disability, nothing about us without us. People have to be listened to. There is most people, and I am one of those, most people who have not got lived experience of disability have no idea. And I had no idea until my children came along. So why are people trying to organize policies and systems and not know how the actual daily life of people is. Yeah, we have the experts. You you have all got Jonathan on your screen. He's an expert. Ask him. Um, the NDIA has now got one board member with a disability. Um, I don't know of many staff in the NDIA that have disability. Certainly when I talk to them, they don't understand disability. Um, they don't understand the equipment. I was just in my current plan, uh, I would have been given money for a bed, but I asked for a mattress, an electric mattress. It's a completely different thing. No one seems to understand the difference, um, which leads me beautifully to Jonathan. Um, he's the expert. We should be asking people with disability what they need and how they would like the scheme to run and how it will work for them. And that is the biggest single mistake that we're making. Great, thank you, Heike. Um, really appreciate you, you sharing. Um, Jonathan, I might turn to, to you now and ask, ask similar questions. Um, a slight shift because you um, do have lived experience i um, really interested in hearing, I guess, a, a day in the life. What, what is your, your personal experience and then, um, you know, with disability and then um, your experience with the NDIS uh, and what improvements you would recommend and why? Over to you. Well, for me, I do a Oh. 
online like shares and writing of assignments and really for me what I think is the most profound aspect of the NDIS is in the olden days of blog funding, I was so dependent on my parents and emotionally it felt conflicting but to at least to make sense the power of the NDIS is I get to treat my parents as now be my parents are here I get some time to be a intelligent thoughtful person and when I observe the current debate around the end of yes, people with disabilities are consulted, but I don't feel that consultation always gets to the policy development stage. So really, I would hope that if Nicolette is elected with the help of people like me and Heike and all the rest of the wonderful people joining us, we can foster a more inclusive and responsive system. Thank you, Jonathan. I think you picked up a couple of um, really interesting um, points there and, and going back looking what was in place before NDIS. So um, what I heard was when it was the block funding arrangements, you were much more dependent on your parents. And so the NDIS has come with this um, empowerment and this promise of um, being able to, to, to be more in control of your own um, destiny than, than the, the block funding did. Um, uh, but also that, that the scheme is not being, whilst there is some consultation, the scheme is not really being developed and maintained with um, 
uh, yourself and with, with um, others living with disability. Um, is that fair? Yes, I know, I know that everything is being made. I'm not being negative, but really it's feared as a participant as instead of being at the center of the Seeking will travel keyboard warrior. <laughs> Instead of being at the center of the scheme, you're trapped being a, a keyboard warrior. Which, yeah. which I find, I find funny, Jonathan. Sorry, I'm, I'm going off script a little bit here, but I find funny given the nature of um, the organisation that you run and how it is about engaging and, and you know using um social media etc so, yeah. so, <laughs> um, but you know you're, just you're mirroring mechanisms. <laughs> just mirroring that it's exactly the same for the parents we end up fighting and fighting and just like jonathan we would like to just be parents we don't yes. want to be support workers we want to enjoy our children and not you know it, it's just an unhealthy relationship as jonathan was saying he's He's writing his uni essays with his parents' help. And that's, it's just not okay because it's, it's Jonathan's independent life. And as a parent, we have an independent life. And we want to have a normal parent-child relationship where we can piss each other off if we have to, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and that's, that is the power of the NDIS. When it's working well, and as Jonathan said, when he's in the center of making his decisions of what he wants. It is an enormously trans transformative and empowering scheme. It's just that instead it's become a bureaucratic nightmare. And yes, Jonathan ends up spending all his time as a keyboard warrior fighting within society to have his voice heard, but even fighting the very organization that's supposed to be there to, to accentuate his voice and they're not listening either and i know that some of the people on this zoom um, have personal experience of what a nightmare the ndia can be to deal with i can thank you um so much um i think that that story of um keeping um uh, people living with disability at the center um, of the scheme and focusing on the on the independence for, um, for people with disabilities is um, really key, and that's come through um, really clearly. Um, I might turn to the crowd now. We've got about fifteen minutes or so for, for others to share story before we jump into questions. Um, Wendy, you were first in with a comment, so I'm going to turn to you first. Um, keeping in mind, we've got we've got um, a handful of people that will want to speak, so. Um, maybe just a few minutes to share your uh, your experience. Thank you. Yes, um, um, my experience has been a nightmare. So I'll start with something more positive. Um, in that, um, I do know someone who's only ever had a positive experience, and so for me that continues to give me hope. And I talk to her about what works so well, and and it makes me green with envy that she's allowed to know the name of her planner. She's allowed to have her planner's phone number. She's allowed to have her planner's email address. I'm not allowed any of those things at all. And um, because um, I've, I've got three sons, two of them are on the, N, um, on the NDIS. Um, and because um, one of my sons was a former ward. I'm not allowed to have a local area coordinator either. We don't qualify for them. There's a lot of discrimination against people who were former wards of, of the state. Every dealing that I've had with them has been horrendous and just no, no exceptions. I, I live, oh, so I'll just give you a few small scenarios. This ridiculousness of us not knowing identity we only know first names and often then only half a first name. So I might know that it's Joe, so I don't know if it's 
Josephine or Joseph, or something might be signed off Pat. Is that Patrick? Is it Patricia? I don't know who I'm dealing with. And other names such as Kim, which can be even gender. And so a really significant document is signed off by half of a Christian name. Um, so there's just no accountability. You don't know who it is that made this decision. I had someone called Sue at the Chatswood office make a significant decision about us. And when I finally was able to ring Chatswood office on one occasion, I'm then told, so which Sue did you want? We have three. And so I have no idea. There's no accountability at all. Like I said, no way of contacting. Um, they, 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 no, so um, another frustrating example that um, I very recently had is that I was stood up at two meetings in a row on both the 4th and 13th of April, so very recently, stood up for two meetings. And then the criteria for what we were asking for changed on the 18th of April, so just last week. And we're no longer eligible now because the criteria changed then. When I turned up for the two meetings on the 4th and the 13th, the NDIS didn't. They wouldn't have tolerated me standing them up for two meetings. Um, I had my confidentiality breached in one meeting I went to where there were lots of people. Um, the, the NDIS brought up without any warning to me a legal matter I'd been involved in many years ago that I had no idea they knew about. I'd never discussed it with them. That I'd been required to send to sign a very strict um, confidentiality agreement about. And I certainly didn't want all of the care workers in this room privy to the information that this worker from the NDIS suddenly spilled out to the entire room. And there was nothing that I could do about that. Um, we need complaints are horrendous that when you my experience has been if, if I lodge a complaint, it can be months before I hear anything back. And then the, the complaint isn't addressed in any way, form or, or manner. Um, it's also been my experience. My, my son, who's got the most complex disabilities, is in supported accommodation or SIL accommodation. And I find that um, the NDIS will talk to the SIL provider about different things. Um, will be given false and misleading information. And while they check out every single thing that I tell them, really closely scrutinise it, they scrutinise nothing that comes from the SIL provider because the information I've become privy to a long time after it's been provided has been just so far wrong. But I, I don't become privy to it until a year after the event and it's very hard to do anything about it. And then a group of people that I feel most passionate about and very emotional about, it's been a passion of mine for a long time, are either people in civil accommodation who are former wards of the state with no family contacts. Um, some people who are former wards do, do have family contacts, but some don't. Or other people with um, complex needs who don't have any family or advocates to care for them. And I have seen time and again, firsthand, not second or third hand, time and time again, where funding is not being used for the purpose for, um, for which it's been granted, where people are not receiving good services, where um, I've just witnessed it time and time again, we need somebody somewhere who can check that people who can't speak or advocate for themselves and don't have family or advocates to do it for them can actually check on what is actually happening. There is nobody frequently, there's nobody at all. We need something like an official visitor scheme or something where people have the right to go in to look at the plan and to look at what is being provided that I, I see that the things I have seen, like I said time and again, and I'm not talking long time ago, I'm talking recently, um, where it's clear that funds are not being used for which, for which they were intended. Um, it, when, Wendy, um, I'm gonna have to jump in there and I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, 
I really appreciate this. There's so much that you've, you've, you've um, passed through to us there. There's a couple of things that, that I picked up that I just want to check that I understood properly because a, a lot of the theme really that that came down to for me was um, that, that the service isn't being provided um, well uh, and money is not necessarily being... Not used. being applied I did at all in some cases. Yes, um, and, and, and but there's zero accountability um, for right. um, the agency, um, which to me goes to the role of the commission the NDIS commission um, who, uh, oh, I could get this wrong, but, but effectively is the sort of the, the regulator of the agency, making sure that the, that the scheme is being administered as it is meant to be administered. And Heike, Jonathan, you might know this better than I, I, I think com complaints ends up with the commission as opposed to through the agency themselves. Do you, do you know, is that right or have I got that wrong? Heike, do, do you know about? Oh, I was. I think Jonathan can answer this one. No? Uh, Jonathan. No? It is correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so thank you very much, Wendy. Well, but I have to say though, this complaints commission. Um, let me just put into context. I don't know if anyone has followed the story of Anne Marie Smith. But there we had a service provider who was collecting money for all her daily life um, needs, for all her personal care, her community access, everything. Uh, they sent one carer and Anne-Marie died um, from the effect of pressure wounds and malnutrition um, because basically she was totally neglected for about a year. Um, the service provider was fined, I believe, $15,000 and told the particular carer was, uh, had criminal prosecution and is now in jail. Um, the service provider was told they shouldn't be doing that again. I mean, I'm sorry. Um, I think someone put in the comments, um, service providers are charging ridiculous prices for a same service under NDIS compared to if you pay for something privately. So quite often I will organize things and people ask me, are you with the NDIS? And I go, no, self-funded. And the price goes down. And I've had service providers put that in emails, in writing. Strictly speaking, that's not allowed. Um, I know that um, some of the residential places um, run by very big service providers who shall remain nameless, but very, very big. Uh, what they're doing is close to criminal neglect. The problem is the Oversight Commission and the NDIS legally would have to shut them down because they do not follow the rules as set out in the NDIS Act. But where are the people going to go? Who's going to do the care? It's the same as in the aged care facility. We know that there are, there are aged care places, um, providers that do not follow the law and are in flagrant breach of the law. But if we shut them down, where is grandpa going to go? So yes, we have it. it. The system is there, but the system is not actually working and is not actually implemented properly because it's structurally underfunded, understaffed, understaffed by people who don't know what they're doing and a bureaucratic nightmare that goes nowhere. Um, team, I'm really conscious of, of time. Um, there's a lot of great comments in the... Um, the chat, some of which I'll, I'll take as uh, comments um, more so than, than um, stories to share. Um, Rob, uh, you raised a, a comment about a friend that has had a stroke and is in a wheelchair um, and uh, he's happy with his NDIS um, support so far, but concerned that he's going to, um, uh, when he turns 67, will be moved to the age pension and lose NDIS um, benefits. Um, do you want to just share a little bit more about that, and then we can actually address the um, the question at the at the core of it? Because I think I think yeah, yeah, sure, Ed. I mean, a crazy situation. I guess it's because of the the way in which the government services tend to be compartmentalised. You know, aged care for one and the NDIS for another. And you know, here's a guy. He's um, paralysed in a wheelchair. He um, has a, an aged mother in her 80s who's probably in a worse condition than he is. Um, so really no support. 
And, you know, in five years' time, uh, because of the way in which the, the, the services are packaged by the government, he is going to lose the opportunity to get, um, you know, new wheelchairs or whatever the, the um, things are that he needs um, because he simply won't be able to do that on the aged pension. Um, so, you know, it just strikes me as insane that uh, we can have a system that uh, prejudices old age people to this extent. Great. Thank you very much for, um, for sharing. I might jump down to, um, there's a comment in here from Tara Hannon, um, uh, which, um, and Tara, feel free to elaborate on this, but, but you have a daughter that's in the NDS and you're concerned about it being driven by um, actuaries and politicians without educating, empowering and enabling um, uh, and, and concerns around transparency, fraud, etc. cetera. Um, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on your experience and, and also particularly, do you have any thoughts on what needs to be done to uh, improve that? Um, how are you? And thank you. I'm glad I signed in tonight. Um, I'm a quite a proactive um, advocate, and I have had my daughter. I've got triplet girls. One's 18, or they're all 18. One has disabilities. Most of the intervention work that I did, I did way before the NDIS. So I would have spent about one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars on supporting my daughter with unbelievably good outcomes. Um, she's still going to need help and support. We don't have a significant NDIS program, but she's got intellectual disabilities and cerebral palsy. Um, but I think about what's going to happen in the future when I'm not around. So I've spent a lot of time. I came out of a corporate world and my little antenna went up very early on when I saw the amount of money being spent by consultants. And a lot of the focus is at the back end. I didn't see any common, I'm a scientist, so I didn't see what I consider common data models or um, analysis of the people with the actual disabilities looking at their life journeys. It's fairly predictable, the kind of support people are going to need if you actually look at individuals, we have the technology that allows us to do that. And um, it simplifies resourcing. And I also think just looking at people that are on the NDIS is not going to be the answer because we've got an aging population. So I'm a bit of an advocate for an overhaul of the systems. I'm very much a... Um, and I had a good chat with Alistair Henskins about this, as well as Paul Fletcher, about the importance of community supports and engaging the three tier levels of government and parents and family and carers and communities. So I'm very keen to find out more about what Nicolette's plans are with this and um, to um, support a team that is wanting to do this. Um, I think you've got communities institutionalize something. Uh, oh, sorry, Tara, is it just me or, or are others losing Tara as well? Yeah, I, I didn't get the last bit. Sorry, Tara, it started to break up, so we will have to um, have to move on, um, but maybe if you do come back online. Oops. Oops. Are you there? Yes, yep. yes, we're back. Yeah, so not enough is being put into local enablement. And so I'm very happy to have a chat with Nicolette. I don't have her email, but it's something I've, I've gone, I've done a cabinet submission on it. Um, so look, We'll see where all of this rolls out. And I know that there's a lot of unrest regarding disability and the funding. Um, people that were there during the foundation of it are completely shattered by what's been rolled out. And it is very disappointing. So I, 
I do think, you know, you don't, people have been frightened by the independent assessments. That shouldn't have happened, have to be done. And the other area is around privacy of data. Just like the previous lady talked about a breach in her private information, we're actually at greater risk when you see that the disability organizations are now creating data lakes. And that has made me very believe in the sovereignty of my child's data as well as my own. So, you know, I think they're treading on thin ice on that particular area. And I think they know it now, um, but what they're not actually doing is fixing it. Thank you, Tara. That's, that's an angle one that I hadn't thought about before around um, the, the collection and use of, of the data and what's actually going um, on yeah. there. Um, really appreciate the, the input. Um, Tim, we've, we've got about 12 minutes left before we end the, the session. Um, there's lots of fantastic comments in there and some really helpful um, suggestions. I want to make sure that um, Nick uh, has the opportunity to sort of to close things out as well, but also wanted to um, give you the opportunity to ask any questions that you um, did have of her. So we might um, move um, on um, to the next uh, section. Um, a few people did send um, questions in advance. So um, if you do have questions that you'd like to raise, please um, uh, do pop them in the chat. But um, Nick, if it's okay with you, I might start with a couple that came through uh, in advance. Sure, go um, ahead. I've just been taking, I'm looking sideways because I'm taking all these notes down and copying the comments from the chat as well. It's um, it's very rich. Um, so thank you. Continue. Yes, ask questions. So first question that came through was, um, do you support more funding for special needs schools and or better support um, people living with special needs to be mainstreamed in the existing public school system? Oh, okay. Um, that's that's a really challenging question. Um, I've heard from, from Heike um, that that research has been, uh, well, there was an example even in Italy where children with disability and even mainstreamers, if you like, actually the outcomes for schooling is better when they they go to school together uh, and not segregated. And um, Heike was telling me that in Italy they've actually abolished the concept of special schools on this evidence. So um, that's one side. The other side is I also understand that uh, whilst most in the disability community want properly funded inclusion in mainstream schools that some don't want, um, do want special schools. Um, so I said my, probably my takeout is that to answer this well and adequately, um, let's talk to people um, who are at the center of this. Uh, I think that's kind of how all my decision-making happens when I'm um, uh, expert or not. And this is one area I'm not. So community consultation is gonna be critical to answering that question well, Ed. Um, and um, that's how I, I will do all my policy. I think there's even a slide, I think, in the deck. I wonder if it's time to show that or we want to show it at the end. Um, I, can, I can bring it up. I know, I've just gone, we did have a plan and Ed loves it when I change it. It's important that you change things. on. Yeah, the, I know. Time. I just want to, so people say, you know, what are your policies on these things? And I just want to say, I, um, I have a number of principles that I know the people in Bradfield want. There are a whole lot of things, everything, the national security, regional development. I do not have deep policies on these things. I have a lot of learned experience. But what my model for, for being your representative is, is basically in front of you here, which is to research, listen and, and, and prepare with input from experts. Um, then to propose those to the people of Bradfield through a number of different fora and particularly working with people with disability and their carers, I'm extremely cognizant that there are people with different abilities that will need different ways of enga being engaged and participating in that. That requires a lot more non-traditional ways that an able person would consider. So even just setting this engagement process up needs consideration for a broader range of people in our community so they can be heard and their voice expressed through me in the parliament. The third part, of course, is then um, national interest and common sense, which is my overlay on how I would be preparing views. So that question about um, 
um, or funding for, for, for special needs schools, I think would go through this process um, because I, I don't feel well equipped to answer it. Um, it seems right, um, but let's have a look at the merit of all the, um, the information there. Great, thank you, Nick. Um, there's a couple of questions that came through from uh, from Destiny, who I feel like I saw her in the chat. So, so Destiny, I think you might be on the line. So if I don't do justice to the questions that you raised, um, please jump in and, and, and correct me. Um, uh, uh, some of you may have seen that um, uh, Labor has recently come out with its NDIS policy, um, which uh, broadly speaking seems to be aimed at returning the NDIS to its original um, ethos uh, and streamlining application and review processes, which we've heard a little bit about um, tonight. Uh, so Nick, interested in your um, your views on, on that policy, if you have the chance to. Yeah, and that. thanks for sending that through, Desney, if I just jump straight in. Uh, had a look at um, Bill Shorten's written statement on that. I couldn't find anything more broadly than that. And he's the, the Shadow Minister for the NDIS. Um, though in principle, it appears really sensible. Um, that's to ensure that the NDIA is working well, um, to reduce leakage from the system, to make planning processes more efficient, and, and really, really key, and I've just heard this tonight as well, to co-design any changes with people living with disability. And of course, the other stakeholders such as workers and, and operators in the sector. He also provided a few other points. They all seem sensible, but again, to my um, schematic, uh, I'd, have, I'd be eliciting um, input and views from people in the electorate um, as well as experts before backing Mr. Shorten's piece, but from a from a, a skim through, it all makes sense. And it's a, quite a good summary of the, a lot of the issues that I've heard tonight. Thanks, Nick. Um, I, I feel like this one- uh, um, Just really quickly, I wondered too, whether Desney herself had a view on that. So maybe later Desney, you can contact us or type something in or whatever, but I'd love to hear your views on that as well in due course. Um, I, well, like I, I just have to quickly say, no, I have not voted for Bill Sh for Labour ever in my life, but um, the reality is that he was there when the whole original NDIS was designed, so he has a reasonably good grasp on it, and he is actually one of the politicians that has consulted a lot with people with disabilities, so I'm sure it's not perfect, but he's got a pretty good grasp on what's happening. Absolutely. Thank you, Destiny. Um, I feel like this one ends up sounding like a Dorothy Dixon, but it's not because it came through from Destiny in advance. Um, uh, are you open to meeting with people in Bradfield to discuss um, their needs and suggestions on NDIS? I feel like that one's already answered. Yes, this. absolutely. <laughs> no other way to do it. Yep. Yes. Uh, and what about working with local councils? Well, yes, absolutely. Well, actually, um, when I first met Jonathan, well, not first digitally, but first in real life um, at Gordon Markets, that was the first thing um, he basically <laughs> got me with in the corner. He said, you know, for heaven's sake, I'm the local, I'm, I'm local and I need to be at the centre. We need to bottom up this decision making and we need to hear from people on the ground what they need here in a timely fashion and the resources have got to come here. So I think absolutely um, the local council is a conduit to all of those three stakeholder groups. So yeah, uh, classic federal, state, local, yes. Um, sorry, Jonathan, if I, you know, but that's, what did you say? That's pretty much, it's very important we include the stakeholders in the local space, yes. Um, and another one that's come through in advance uh, and please, in the chat, I'm, I'm seeing several comments. I'm not actually seeing any specific questions coming through. Um, but if you do have a question, please feel free to raise it. Um, another question that came through in advance, obviously this has been very high profile over the last um, week or so. Uh, during the leaders debate, Morrison said in response to an audience question that he was blessed to have two daughters who do not have a disability. Um, and he's been taken to task for it. Um, what's your views and response um, to Morrison's comments? Hmm, that's, yes, it was very cringeworthy, wasn't it? And much has been said and written about the Prime Minister and what he said. And I'd like to believe he, he wasn't intentionally trying to be offensive. It just comes obviously quite naturally to him often. Um, and I do acknowledge that his words offended a lot of people. Um, 
I'm probably more concerned by his actions, to be said. Um, from what I've seen and heard, I don't believe disability rights and inclusion um, and fixing the NDIS is a high priority for him and his government. So I, I believe that needs to change. Great, thank you, Nick. So, so we've got just a couple more minutes left and again, um, uh, similar views from those on the line, I would say about that particular um, issue. Um, unless there's any further comments or questions, um, I might just uh, pass through to um, what's coming next um, before we uh, hand over to Nick to, to close out um, the event. Uh, so to start with, I'd just like to thank everyone for uh, turning up and um, participating. I've been blown away by um, uh, the, the willingness to share, I guess, um, in the in the comments, and I guess that's consistent with the um, the desire for consultation uh, in this space. Um, so obviously, we're we're neck deep in a campaign at the moment. So what's next for um, Nick? First things first, um, vote one Buller. <laughs> so uh, if you keep voting the same way, uh, things are going to stay the same. Um, and secondly, and this is possibly the most important point on the slide, is spread the word. Um, if you know people for whom disability rights and inclusion are important um, and you feel you like what you've um, been able to share tonight and heard from Nick tonight, um, then please tell them about Nick. Um, also jump in and help fund uh, the campaign um, and then join another great event. So I've, I've listed just a few, but, but um, on the website at the moment, there are, there are tons of events um, up there. Uh, so the Clean Tech Opportunities event um, that I've listed on the 28th there uh, is at Pimble Golf Club, but it's sold out. Um, and so due to that overwhelming de demand, um, we'll be live streaming it. Um, and so Nicolette will be joined by um, Saul, Grif Saul Griffith, who um, funded, founded Rewiring Australia, Zoe Witten, a partner at Pollination, and Mara Bunn of Australian Impact Investments, as well as Colin Liebman, um, the Director of Renewable Energy Developments. Um, and then on the 30th, uh, Sam Graham and Nicolette um, will be discussing um, the outcomes of a, a community survey that was conducted over late last year and this year. Um, and also Dr. Helen Cannon will share the findings from the March three, um, uh, three, genera the March three generations roundtable. And then finally, uh, the Linfield uh, fun run. Uh, so if you enjoy a, a walk or run or um, uh, have a canine companion that you would like to get out and about with, um, join Nick and her supporters for the Linfield fun run um, starting at 8am on Sunday morning. Um, uh, registration fees um, go to K KYDS, which is uh, a local uh, network for mental health services for teenagers. Um, so thank you very much for um, your attendance. And, and Nick, I might just hand over to you for a final word. Thanks, Ed. Um, I just wanted to um, remind people that schematic that this is how I will do positions when elected. Um, it will, my positions in the parliament will be informed and governed by the people with disability um, when it comes to issues that impact people with disability and other key stakeholders, such as carers and advocates. I've heard tonight that um, NDIS is, is a system, but this is bigger. It, there's around, there's discrimination's an issue, and as is um, ableism uh, as the embodiment of that discrimination. I've also heard that local representation um, in the decision-making bottom-up is, is key part to it and co-design. I'm gonna be um, keeping my eye out for any more um, things that um, politicians drop in about what they wanna do on the NDIS in particular. Um, I would like to leave with you that I am um, to, to thank you for your contribution and please know that once elected, I will be a fierce, fierce advocate sure. and amplify the voice of people with living with disabilities so that we can all move forward together. And as part of my platform, let's not leave anybody behind and let's go forward together. So thank you so much for joining the conversation and particularly um, to people who generously and courageously shared their stories. Um, and and um, I hope to turn these around and actually have some, some really good positions to take with me when I'm elected. Thank you. Thanks all.